What's up, friends? Welcome to another episode of Auto Afflicted. I'm your host, Ali Goulet, and today I'm creeping around the Utah Motorsports Campus, and I stumbled onto Ian Lacey Racing. There's got to be something cool in here. I'm going to poke my head in and see um, you know, what we can see, what might be going on. Oh, wow. snuck into this little place, poke my head in, and who did I find but Ian Lacey, obviously, because it's it's his race division, and uh, he's kind enough. He's going to show us around a little bit, tell us about what he does, and um, you guys, it's crazy in here. Yeah, so yeah, this is Ian Lacey Racing. We're based here at UMC in Utah, just outside of Tuella, and uh, basically, we're kind of a comprehensive race shop. Uh, what we have in here today is a, a little bit of everything. We've got some formula cars, some vintage cars, some of our NASA cars, and then uh, we're also contracting with a race team to support a Honda TCX in the SRO uh, race series that runs nationwide. So yeah, we stay pretty busy out here. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, just looking around, I, I see some pretty amazing stuff. You're going to walk us through it a little bit? Yeah, I'd be happy to. What would you like to see first? Um, I mean, we're standing here by the, the open wheel cars. I'd love to know a little bit about this. And then, of course, I can see that, you know, the Ferrari is behind. So. Right, right. Yeah, so we have a couple different open wheel cars here. They're all from basically the same era. So we have some Pro Formula Mazdas and some Indy Lights. And these ran in the Road to Indy ladder system from 2004 to about 2014. Uh, so I built the two Pro Mazdas that we have in here, the 43 and the 6 down at the end, uh, over the last couple of years out here for various customers. And uh, the 43 has just been purchased by a local guy who's going to do some SVRA vintage racing with it. So we've got it in here, kind of tuning it up, making sure it's ready to go. Uh, with the Indy Lights cars here, we have a, a couple that came from Fan Force United, which was... Uh, a team that was running in the Pro Series there with a couple different drivers over the years. Uh, these are pretty nifty. So again, all everything in the road to Indy. So as you come out of go-karting, you progress through open wheel cars trying to make it to IndyCar. Okay. And you would start in a Formula Mazda and they weigh about 1,200 pounds and they have 270 horsepower out of a Mazda Renesis engine. And then you graduate up into an Indy Lights car. In this era, these things were a little bit heavy because they were primarily or originally designed to run on ovals. Okay. So that chassis is pretty stout and they weigh about 1600 pounds but they have a 420 horsepower Nissan based V8 engine so a bit quicker mm -hmm. um, and these things were pretty speedy they do you know right right almost 200 miles an hour at Indianapolis so oh, wow. they were they're pretty trick cars um, so this car is getting ready for some service the 11 here we're just uh, doing an engine replacement uh, gearbox inspection getting some paintwork freshened up over the winter here okay. and it'll be ready to go soon in the spring and Dallin's just uh, loading up the gearbox with some fresh mobile one there so nice yeah uh, this one is a little bit different this is a Mazda DP02 so this is kind of a full-bodied version of the Formula Mazdas. It uses the same chassis and a lot of the same suspension components. Um, this is designed to run as a support series for IMSA back in the day. And it's got a four-cylinder Mazda MZR engine in it. Okay. And uh, same gearbox as the Pro Mazda, six-speed sequential. Um, so this car was a recent purchase by a local fellow and is going to be running it in the NASA series. So we're just giving it a full going through and need a little bit of attention, honestly, uh, new wrap and so on and so forth. Right. So waiting on some parts and she'll be ready to go here at the end of the month. And like for those that don't know everything about open wheeled cars, I mean, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the, the chassis, um, you know, is it is monocoque carbon fiber or what's, what's actually going on? Yeah, yeah. So, yes, these use a carbon fiber chassis. Um, it just runs basically from just ahead of your feet back to the back of the fuel cell. And then the engine is a semi-stressed member, so it does have a little tubular 
subframe back there, uh, but in this car, the engine, you know, is actually fairly stressed. It bolts directly to the chassis, and then the gearbox bolts directly to the engine. Okay. Uh, suspension is all push rod and bell crank, so the dampers are under the cover here, and we'd be happy to take some of these things apart if you'd like to see. Uh, but yeah, you got your spring uh, and shock combination as well as the sway bar placed underneath the shock cover here at the front. You can see the push rods here. They uh, operate a bell crank in here, and that's what operates the spring. Okay. Um, so we have less unsprung weight. We get it out of the air, and it's, it's all contained in the bodywork there. Um, at the back, it's very similar. Um, the gearbox uh, carries all the suspension components here. So same thing. We've got your push rod and your bell crank pushing on the spring and the damper combination here. And then this car doesn't actually run a rear sway bar, but if it did, it would connect off the bell crank with these push rods and sit in the bell housing right there. Oh, interesting. little tiny guy. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, achieving the same goal. Yep. Yeah. That's, yep. Wow. So everything's, yes, pretty small and, and works on, you know, mechanical advantage, right? So we right. don't have this big bar running all the way across the car. It's just about four inches wide. Right. So. Keeping more stuff out of the wind as much as possible. Yep. 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 So. Um, and then, yeah, Hewlin six-speed sequential gearbox. Um, these ones, you still operate with a, with a, well, I'm sorry, actually, this car is paddle shifted with a pneumatic system. Okay. The Pro Mazda is here. They operate with a lever uh, on the right side of the cockpit, and it does have a no-lift upshift, so you can just hold your foot flat on the floor, pull the upshift, but you do have to blip for the downshift. Okay. Match, match yep. engine speed. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Um, um, I was going to say, I noticed here, like my whole channel, we're, I'm we're all about Mercedes. And so, you know, my eye is on this 280 SE over here. Right. Um, can you tell me a bit about this? Yeah, yeah, that was my grandfather's old car. Um, bought it new in 71 in Sacramento, California. It's got 204,000 miles on it, but original paint, aside from the front end, it got some rock chip repair back in the day and it's due for some more. Um, I just went out and picked this up in Wisconsin. It's been sitting for a couple of years, so spent a couple of days just going through it, getting the brakes right, and uh, hit the road and, and brought it out here to Utah. Um, and that is its eighth time across the country. <laughs> Grandpa kept really good records, so there's a logbook in there of like every trip and every tank full of gas he put in the thing. And man, what a what an amazing piece of engineering, you know the uh, the car with that many miles. It, it does have a couple little faults here and there the the valve guide seals are going bad so it smokes a little bit when you start it up but you know that trip from wisconsin out here it didn't burn a drop of oil mm. and it just ran better and better and better the further we went so that was a lot of fun that's cool i'm you know i'm super impressed with with what the old mercedes did the new ones are cool too but i personally have an 88 300 uh, ce okay. that has 200,000 miles on it it sat in the bay area for about eight years and then we fired it up and braved it through the mountains and it made it without a hiccup. Right. So like the, you know, just a testament to, to that Mercedes quality, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, German engineering, you can't beat it, right? Yeah, I could go without some of it, but yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> the, the engineering's brilliant, but sometimes it's so frustrating. <laughs> right. Right, right, yeah, yeah, they're a little different, but uh, yeah, that thing's pretty cool. Yeah, that thing's amazing, I love it. Um, Will you show me the Ferraris? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got uh, an interesting Ferrari here. This is a replica of a 1968 Ferrari P4. Uh, a lot of you would recognize these from the Ford versus Ferrari movie. So this was Ferrari's answer to the Ford GT40. And this is a one-off, all-aluminum replica built by a fellow out of New Zealand named Rod Tempero. And he's fairly well known for doing a lot of Jaguar replicas, some Maseratis, and so on. Um, and he did this one a couple years ago. Uh, so as mentioned, it's all aluminum. It is just achingly beautiful, this thing. Uh, we love looking at it. Uh, it's powered by a Ferrari 400i V12. Okay. Uh, it was originally fuel injected, but it's on Weber carburetors now. And we honestly have had some challenges getting it running properly. Um, we've gone through the carbs and, and done some jetting and partially that's, we're at altitude up here, so we have to adjust a little bit. Uh, but we finally got it and it, it runs pretty good. Um, couple other little things we have to address. It's got a little gearbox leak. It uh, runs a ZF five-speed gearbox, uh, similar to what you would find in a Pantera okay. or a GT40. And yeah, it's, it's letting the oil out. So we're going to have the gearbox out here shortly. Uh, but yeah, this thing is, is really nifty. We, we're honored to have it here. Uh, it's cool to know that it has the Ferrari power plant because I was 
that was the next thing I was wondering was, you know, now that I knew it, it was a replica, you know, I was praying there wasn't a Ford engine in there. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it makes all the right noises. Yeah, cool. Yeah. What about this other one over here? Yeah, so we have a, quite a Can-Am car collection here <laughs> going. Uh, so the Can-Am series, uh, believe started in around 1965 ran till I think 72 or 73 something of that sort uh, kind of a nifty series ran across North America and Canada uh, no rules you know you had to have two seats you went 200 miles and that was kind of it so it became an arms race real quick like especially in the powertrain department um, this particular car is the 1966 Lola T70 uh, one of the earlier cars from the championship and this one is powered by a small block Ford on Weber carburetors. Um, we're not exactly sure, but we think about 550 horsepower. Okay. Um, but dyno? Yeah, yeah, exactly, in the paddock. Uh, this one came to us just a couple months ago. We have only had it on the track very briefly. It had some braking issues, so we had to get some components machined for the, for the braking system, but uh, we just got it back together the other day, so as soon as the snow melts out there, we'll, we'll get it out. Um, some interesting history on this particular chassis. It wasn't driven by a well-known driver. It was a gentleman named Bob Busher out of the East Coast. And he did a couple Can-Am races, but mainly sort of like regional SCCA stuff with it. Okay. Uh, and then depending who you talk to, it was either purchased by Chaparral Cars, which was Jim Hall's team out of Texas, to kind of see what Lola was up to with their latest developments before he built his own cars or it was purchased by All American Eagles, Dan Gurney's race team out of California for the same purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually went to the privateer and uh, you know, kind of pounded around over the years and, and now we've got it here. So that's kind of a nifty one. Um, interestingly enough, I believe it was Bob's father, Jake Busher, had a shop that uh, you know, raced in the SCCA and so on and so forth. And as they were moving up, he wanted to buy a Ferrari, but uh, Chinetti said no. So they got that cool little sticker for their race team with the donkey on it that says Jake Stable to kind of, kind of give Ferrari, you know, the middle finger, I guess you would say. <laughs> Classic. I love that. Yeah, yeah. So um, then uh, behind me here, this is, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have all the body work on it right now, but this is kind of a special one. This is a 1968 McLaren M6B uh, with a big block Ford 427 in it. And this was sponsored by Ford and run by Carroll Shelby for Peter Revson in the 68 Can-Am wow. uh, season. And it wasn't very successful. It was a development year for them. Uh, but it did go to Fuji for an invitational race, and, and Peter Revson won that race with the car. Uh, subsequently, it went to a privateer. They put a Chevy in it. <laughs> and then apparently, the story is, in the middle of the night, he was siphoning fuel out of it, and he caught the thing on fire burned it to the ground and so it sat around for a couple of years and then it was purchased by a gentleman out of Southern California uh, Joe D. Loretto and it was restored by John Collins who was a Carroll Shelby technician back in the day uh, so it's, it's got some some Shelby provenance there it's yeah. got some nifty bits on it like all the little blue anodized bits you see we believe are uh, Shelby built parts and and they anodize them you know Ford racing blue or, or whatever the the, right. the metallic blue color is to kind of match their their livery and on the side pod it's got a carol shelby signature which a lot of things have a carol shelby signature on them right, right. Uh, but i think more importantly it's got a phil remington signature and he was carol shelby's sort of guru machinist engineer crew chief guy who was responsible for a lot of their success in the 60s with the gt40 program and so on and so forth wow yeah so yeah. Um, this car came to us a couple of years ago. We facilitated an engine change or an engine rebuild. It's got a pretty trick 427. It's all aluminum. Uh, it's bored and stroked to 526 cubic inches. Okay. And these engines have a lot of inertia. So for durability, we put kind of a, or we, we spec'd a, a mildish cam. So it's only got 660 horsepower, but it does have 700 foot pounds of torque. So that's that what counts. Yeah. Yeah, the that, torque. <laughs> exactly. So that one's pretty exciting. Um, and then finally, in the Ken Am collection here behind me, we've got the number six Sunoco Special. This was a 1969 Lola T163. It was commissioned by Penske for Mark Donahue to drive in the series. And it was Lola's answer to the McLaren M8s that were pretty much dominating the championship with uh, 
um, with Bruce McLaren and Danny Hume driving. Okay. So uh, Penske talked Lola into building them a lightweight chassis, and to achieve that, they just used thinner steel and aluminum paneling in the monocoque and it is awful thin, it's like <laughs> 30 thou. Um, the car was not very successful. They only ran one race at Mid-Ohio. It suffered some half shaft failures, and I believe ultimately it did get crashed and uh, got set aside, thrown out behind the shop. Uh, Penske went on to concentrate on their AMC Javelin Trans Am program. Okay. Um, and Lola did get them a replacement chassis that was standard gauge, but you know, measuring this one and just pushing on the panels and watching them flex around, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that this is, in fact, a lightweight chassis. So anyways, it hmm. came out of a field and got restored. Um, Zach Brown owned it for a while, and while he was historic racing it, a couple other guys drove it. Um, Bobby Rahal drove it at one of the events, and so wow. on and so forth. So uh, this one's pretty <laughs> cool. Uh, and this one's got a big block Chevy. So again, the arms race continues. Right. Um, you know, mechanical fuel injection, uh, big gnarly cam, supposedly 805 horsepower. Uh, not sure about the torque, but it's it's right up there as well. So that one's pretty cool. And same, we've uh, we just got this one a couple months ago. We've had it out twice now. Yeah. Uh, so kind of going through it and and getting the bugs worked out. And it's a runner. She's pretty fun. Uh, you're you're kind of just blowing my mind that I poked my head in here, and then you know there's all this history and and these beautiful cars. It's uh, yeah, you're blowing my mind. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, yeah. We're very fortunate. You know, it's uh, it's pretty cool to have these things in the shop and and fun to tinker with them and polish them up and and keep them running. You know, we're just a a temporary caretaker, so we do our best and and uh, we'll pass them on to the next generation at some point. Cool. And as far as, you know, Ian Lacey Racing goes, how long have, have you been around? Yeah, so I've been here in Utah since 2008. Um, ran through, you know, a couple shops before I just branded it my own. Um, and uh, we worked originally with a local family that ran a bunch of open wheel cars out here. And then we grew that into some professional involvement with the SRO Championship, uh, running TC, uh, GT4 cars, GT3 cars, and so on and so forth. So we, we try to do a little bit of everything. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Ian, man, really appreciate your time. Beautiful cars. You know, you guys out here, I'm going to drop all the information about Ian Lacey and his whole racing program in the description so you, you can check it all out. Um, and again, just really appreciate the time. Yeah, amazing. My, my pleasure. We, we love to share these things. They're, they, they should be seen and heard when possible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would, love, I would love to hear these. I'm gonna have to come back out sometime. I'll pick your brain afterwards and find out when I might be able to hear these. Um, anyway, guys, thanks for checking it out. As ever, you know, love the ones you're with. Be kind to your neighbors. Use your signals when you're driving. And we'll catch you on the next one.